the great thing about music is that um, just one record can change your mood. You know, if you're feeling depressed or anything, you can just put one record on and it instantly you're in a different place and you're happy or whatever. Hello, this is Chris Lowe welcoming you to Blackpool Tower Ballroom. That's not easy. Well, we lived in a, a middle-class housing estate on the edge of Newcastle in North Gosforth. In fact, we were the we moved there in 1957, I think, when I was about three, and my parents still lived there. And in those days, it was right at the edge of Newcastle, so there were fields behind us. There was a farm behind us. We used to get cows in the back garden. And then I went to uh, Catholic schools, because we were Catholics. When I look back upon my life, it's always with a sense of shame. I've always been the one to blame. For everything I long to do, no matter when or where or who, has one thing in common too. It's the sin. Then I moved to a lovely school called St Oswald's, which was a brand new early 60s primary school with big glass windows, and and I was very happy there. And I was, um, I was and did my 11 plus there. But it was a very playful kind of place as well. It was a, it was a very nice school. And then I went to St Cuthbert's Grammar School, and it was a sort of a sporty school. It was very footbally, and I was had. Not no interest in football. I was fant I never even played football before, to be honest. And I was incredibly bad at it. Anything's possible. We're on the same side, or otherwise, on trial for our lives. I never really felt I fitted in there because I didn't really fit in. Blackpool was quite a fun place to grow up. Um, I was born on the street, um, and at the end of the road was the Pleasure Beach. Then we were brought here as children, as soon as we could walk, maybe before. So from a very early age, we were taken on the Pleasure Beach um, and I seem to spend most of my life in any, in any spare time on there. The Pleasure Beach um, is always changing. That's one of the great things about it. There's always a new ride being built and old ones disappearing. And, you know, I worked here with a summer job once operating the big wheel just down there. and. Uh, if you're born in Blackpool, this is a place that you'll just sort of hang out and sort of take for granted, really. There used to be a very marked contrast between the last day of the season and then the very next day. We go from very busy to very quiet instantly. But I always liked both. I always liked it when it was packed with all the tourists. And, and then it was really great when it became this dead, seaside, boarded up town. And I've always liked that as well. So I like both aspects of it. And I think. That's probably reflected in my personality. I sort of like the morose and the, um, and the fun. So I've always thought that music is about making people happy and having a good time. So I, I think that's because I come from Blackpool. the Young People's Theatre, which met on Saturday mornings. And it was at that time our mother said to me that she had a friend who acted here. So I started to come here then when I was just 11 years old. And I came every Saturday morning, and I was never a very good actor, by the way. 
I remember when I was a bit older, we did Oliver, and I was, was one of the company, but also had this very small speaking part. But then as I got older, I got more interested in writing, and that's when I met my group of friends who were here. My grandfather used to play in the um, Tower Ballroom Band, um, and my mum used to dance in the um, children's ballet here. And it was also the first place that um, I ever danced on a dance floor. Um, when I was two, my parents brought me here. And um, I remember doing the twist, which was the dance of the day. I think it was about over there, actually. Um, and I, th I think that's probably where my love of the dance floor may have started. <laughs> My grandfather played the trombone. He played in bands and that, and then he ended up um, here for a season. But he liked it so much that they stayed here. I think it's probably because of him and because of my mother that they insisted that I, you know, learn the piano and. Um, and of course, because that, I played a, a trombone in the in a bra local northern brass band, and uh, and so I th you know that's probably why I do music because of them. Well, this is the Literary and Philosophical Society in Newcastle, and it's always known as the Lytton Phil for short. And I joined it when, I guess, I was 16 or something. And all my friends joined it. It's a library, which is great, because uh, I've always been interested in books. I love just looking through old books and stuff. But also, it's a, quite a social place. Uh, people come here and uh, just have a cup of coffee, and you can read the papers and the latest periodicals and magazines. It's a very beautiful building, and I've never really ever been anywhere like it. In London, you know, the, the London Library, but it's not such a sort of convivial space as this. So it, it really meant quite a lot to us. And there's a room downstairs called the Loftus Room, where we used to sit and smoke cigarettes and, and chat. We used to get into trouble for making too much noise. I mean, because when we were all 16 and 17, and there was a whole gang of us, I would sort of sympathise now. I'd probably be complaining now. <laughs> <laughs> I was a SWAT at school and uh, was determined to get good exam results because I wanted to go to university to do architecture. We were always moving house when I was young and so I became obsessed with house designs and the plans and stuff and I think I was just always interested in buildings. So we were interested in theatre and music and David Bowie and what have you and we liked this place because it was a secret world within Newcastle. Friends? Oh, I never had any friends. <laughs> At the same time as I'm talking about Newcastle, it was quite a rough place. It was quite scary. Um, when I used to go out on Saturday, it's, you know, at 10.45, you'd be waiting for the last bus home in the Haymarket. And it was really scary, and uh, people used to get beaten up. that made you feel a bit like an outsider in Newcastle. I mean, I was always thinking I would leave Newcastle. I mean, I had a fondness for it because of my friends. But sometimes on Saturday nights, we used to go into the station and fantasize about running away down to, down to London. And in fact, the first track on our first album, please, which is called Two Divide by Zero, is in fact inspired by that. Let's not go home, we'll catch the late train. When I was growing up, Newcastle was still an industrial city. 
there was still shipbuilding and steelworks nearby and coal mines. All of that's gone now. My interest in music started when I was very young. It's the first film I can remember seeing was The Young Ones with Cliff Richard and thinking it was just fantastic. And then the Beatles appeared and we were all obsessed by the Beatles. Me and my sister and my brother were, um, were totally obsessed by the, by the Beatles. And it was a very musical time in the 60s and, and our parents would take an interest in it as well. We'd all sit and watch Top of the Pops and Sunday Night at the London Palladium. And, and I asked to get a guitar uh, and I wanted to write songs. We had a school dance band and then from that we formed a little splinter group. And uh, when we were about 17 or so, we, um, we were members of the Musicians' Union. We used to play like local conservative club dues and Masonic lodges and things like that. And uh, we used to earn some decent money out of it, actually. <laughs> and I did a thing called Days, which was a sort of compilation of um, extracts from books, poetry and um, plays for which I also wrote, which I put together, and also wrote four songs for it, which I performed with two friends. Uh, and um, it was quite well received, actually. I think we did it for three nights. It was, um, you know, Glenn Miller stuff, things like that. Um, we used to play the stripper, which used to go down very well. A great trombone part. Uh, and some sort of 60s beat style music. Yeah, a bit of everything, really. Moon River was always a popular one. I started a group with a friend, with three friends actually, called Dust, and we were very influenced by the incredible string band. I used to hate progressive rock. Newcastle was a great city for progressive rock. I mean, I saw Led Zeppelin at the Newcastle City Hall, but it, and I liked Led Zeppelin, but most of it wasn't my cup of tea, really. And, uh, and in between the Beatles and David Bowie, we all liked the incredible string band because they were kind of weird. It gave me an experience of performing in front of a crowd and what got the crowd going. and. You know, actually, I really liked seeing people having a really good time because of something that you were doing on the stage. And also, we only had acoustic guitars because that's all we could afford. We had no amplifiers. In fact, I didn't have any electronic equipment of any type to kind until the Pitch Rock Boys took off. <laughs> I only got an electric guitar in about 87. Oh, it was exactly the same. Pretty static, moody, hiding behind a music stand. <laughs> Nothing, nothing's really changed, actually. In 1972, I moved to London, and I lived in Tottenham for three years. We were in London. Let's do it. Let's break the law. And it was interesting because Tottenham was a very West Indian area, and uh, we lived on the street, pounding with reggae music, and I, we used to love it. I went to North London Polytechnic, I only got two A-levels, so I, didn't, I, went to, I was going to go to Nottingham University to do history and archaeology. Why I was going to do archaeology, I have no idea. It was a complete whim. And, um, and so I, they, I couldn't get in. And, but North London Polytechnic in those days was the only polytechnic that did history. But I was always in debt at university, so I always had to, to work. I don't know what it would have been like nowadays, having to pay for it as well. You know, because we got a grant then, I couldn't even live within the grant, let alone paying the fees and everything. This um, is, uh, well, it used to be the Dixieland Show Bar, and it's now called Legends, um, but it's on Central Pier in Blackpool. And I used to work here as a glass collector. <laughs> and so I was at I was college until 1975, and uh, I used to do, have a, I, I got a summer job at the British Museum. Um, because I, I had to get a summer job because I had to keep the flat going. And I didn't want to work. In those days, students used to work in factories. And I don't know if they still do. And, and I phoned at the British Museum Department of Manuscripts and said, I'm a student, so I think I can get a summer job. And they said, that's interesting. We were thinking of employing a student the first time. And I went in, and, I, and this was in 1973. And my hair was dyed red, and I was wearing white Oxford bag trousers, and a white shirt and a little white pullover and women's um, wedge-heeled shoes, which were too, it was just size, size six and a half, they too small for me, but they had amazing heels on them. And I clumped in, and I remember I had to go up the spiral staircase, and the noise was phenomenal on, me, on these wedge shoes worn up the staircase. And I thought, well, they'll never give me the job. Why have I come? I should have dressed more soberly. Anyway, they gave me the job immediately. 
I used to love working here because you know I used to like all the music that was around at the time. Um, Ashes to Ashes by David Bowie and there were some great records around then that time and uh, I always used to go out and collect the glasses when I liked the record <laughs> so if I didn't like the music there were lots of glasses on the table but as soon as a good record came on I was out there collecting the glasses um, but what I really remember about this place was the fights that used to take place it was like some you know it's like it's been in some western There were metal chairs at the time and it would be just people, you know, right on people. It was, the whole place erupted. The bar shutters had come down and then there, there used to be a big flight of steps there and people were just literally getting just thrown down these stairs like that. And it was a real experience, you know. You would uh, have your trolley and you'd go and get amazing manuscripts like Handel's Messiah, an original manuscript. And uh, I remember, I used to flick through manuscripts. Uh, like Wilfred Owen's um, manuscripts are all bound in a in a book, and you could and I'd, we'd studied them in English at school, and and uh, I'm, I'm finding George Bernard Shaw's address book, flicking through it, and uh, the manuscripts of Gustav Holst, the composer, his daughter Imogen used to come in, and I did that two two years. It was it was very uh, I used to I used to love it. It's, and also there was something madly mysterious about the about the British Museum. I was meant to me to write a song about it. There were always people being found having sex behind the book stacks in the printed, in the printed books department. Um, it was sort of famous for that. The cafe was shut down because someone died of food poisoning. I think it was inevitable that I'd end up in London because in the architecture course, there's a year when you have to work in an architect's office after the third year. And I don't know, I only applied to architectural offices in London. So obviously, I didn't really consider going anywhere else. But I think there was an inevitability to ending up in London. I mean, it's kind of where everything is real, isn't it? Um, that sounds awful to cut. You're not using that. <laughs> There's no point living anywhere else. <laughs> no, I just I think that London does have a big draw. Um, you know, it's a shame because uh, I think it's a shame for your family when when you just you know up and off somewhere, make somewhere else your home. But uh, that's what happens when you want your children to go to universities. Then when I left college, I went and worked at Marvel Comics. A friend of mine at college was a journalist, uh, and she'd given that up to become a teacher, but uh, she showed me this advert in the UK Press Gazette for a production editor for Marvel Comics, and I went for an interview. And within three weeks of doing my degree, I was working at Marvel Comics as the London production editor. Um, and we had seven comics, weekly comics, edited down from American monthly comics, like Spider-Man and... Incredible Hulk and Conan the Barbarian, and I did, and that set me off in a career in, in publishing, which I was in for the next ten years. Because then I worked for book publishers, and then I ended up at Smash Hits. I sat in my bedroom and wrote songs all the time. I spent them to my friends. No time to lose, and where's the thief who'll tell you everything you've ever known? There's a man. Television, I don't want a television. There's a man on the television, I don't want a television. And now it's rumored that some memory man who has lost his marbles and his memory scan. Somebody heard that nobody can find the key that unlocks the memory bank. It's all stored away. And that's what I was doing when I met Chris. It was in August 1981, and I bought a synthesizer. And I got it at home, and I suddenly thought, I don't know how... What do I plug it into, though? Because it didn't have a speaker in it. And, and I had a sort of stereo system like everyone had then. And so I went down to the hi-fi shop at the King's Road, and, and I said this, and, uh, and he, they made me a jack going into... T two pin stereo thing and uh, but they had to make it they, uh, they stood there and they were they were welding at the back and Chris Slow walked in and um, he lived around the corner on Sydney Street and I lived on the King's Road and we started talking and I told him about the synthesizer and I gave him my phone number and he phoned up about three days later and he came round and we started to write a song
It must have been fate, although I don't believe in fate, because <laughs> um, neither of us are the sort of people that just start friendships like that, you know, talk to strangers. I mean, so I think it was very out of character for both of us that we should spark a friendship in such an unlikely place. Let's make lots of money. Chris was unlike anyone I'd ever known before. We um, found that we liked the same music, we liked the same artists like David Bowie and whatever was around at the time, I can't remember. And we had the same enthusiasm for records and stuff. So, yeah, we got off on that footing, really. I don't know, I sort of had a feeling that my life changed when I met Chris. I'm not just saying that in hindsight, because um, I realised when I met Chris, what I didn't know about writing songs. I just liked the music and I enjoyed making music, but never really saw a potential for making um, you know, a career out of it. We both knew about what the other didn't know about. Um, and that was clear quite quickly. We both bring different things um, and it's a chemistry that just happens to work and I don't think that that happens very often. So it started off as a kind of a hobby, but part of me was watching it thinking that we were doing something quite good. And it took us a while to write anything that was kind of worth having. Um, but one weekend, Chris went back to Blackpool and he came back and said, oh, I've written this thing on the piano. And he gave me the cassette and I wrote the lyric for the song Jealousy. And that was the song we then um, went on to record. I kept hearing this record um, and it turned out to be by Bobby Orlando and it was Passion by the Flirts and I bought the 12 inch of it when I was a very poor student at the time so it was a big deal buying this import. Anyway, I really, really liked it and played it non-stop and, uh, and then Neil was working at Smash Hits and there was this, what was it, bargain, what was it called? The, the, the Dumper Box. The Dumper Box and they discovered a lot of records by Bobby Orlando in there and they were all really great records and uh, so we became huge fans of the work of Bobby Orlando. There's a big overlap of stuff that we both like. If, you know, if it's a what's it called, a Venn diagram, there's quite a big area in the middle that we can both get excited by. And so when I was asked to go to New York to interview the police for Smash Hits, it was a very quick trip. It was really, I think, just a one-night uh, trip. And so I worked. At, and so I said to Chris, "I'm going to phone up Bobby Orlando." And I got his phone number from the PR that did represented his records in Britain. And I phoned him up and, and he was delighted to get a phone call from England and, and he said, oh, let's have, let's have lunch. So the day after interviewing the police, I went round to his office on Broadway and we went out to this cafe called the Applejack um, and had a cheeseburger. And I, and I just talked to him, I was interested to talk about his records because I knew them all so well. It was always interesting to talk to someone about their records. And then I said that, that I was in this group with Chris and he said, oh, let's make a record. And I gave him the demo of Opportunities, Let's Make Lots of Money, which was very much like a Bobby O record at that point. It's the same sort of chord change and the octave bass line. And Bobby O says, oh, I could do this. 
and then I went back to England and uh, three weeks later Chris and I went back to New York and he put us up in a friend's flat at Soft Broadway and we went down to Unique Studios and we used to do these one and a half hour sessions which just seems insane now. I mean our gear takes six and a half hours to set up in the studio nowadays and uh, anyway we went in then there was two keyboards. <laughs> Bobby O came in and Chris and I started to play this instrumental we'd written and I was playing the chords and Chris was playing the dum 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 and Bobby O said, oh, comes come and said, oh, that sounds great. Right, let's record it. And I said to Chris, you know, we, I, that rap I wrote, you can do it over this. I'd written this rap. And so that I went to the microphone. It was the first time I ever sang West End Girls. And uh, Chris hadn't even heard it over the music. I've said it all before, I'll say it all again. We're all modern men. We've got no future, we've got no past. Here today, built to last in every city and every nation, from Lake Geneva to the Finland station. Our West End town, a dead end world. Meet East End boys and West End girls. Oh, West End town, a dead end world. Well, I think I thought, um, God, he can sing at least. Because <laughs> you didn't know, we've been writing music and, um, you know, I thought, wow, he can sing. You got a heart of glass or a heart of stone. Just you wait till I get to you home. All your stopping, stalling and starting. Who do you think you are, Joe Stalin? Sometimes you're better off dead. There's a gun in your hand, it's pointing at your head. In a western town, a dead end world, the eastern boys and western girls. And in comes this guy called Tom Watkins, uh, this big, big sort of camp guy. And I thought, if they're going to take you seriously, you've got to have a manager. And Tom Watkins seemed like he could be a manager. So um, he became our, he agreed to become our manager. Well, the first time I heard about the Pet Shop Boys, they were managed by they were managed by this rather large uh, guy, Tom Watkins, who we'd, uh, uh, we'd nicknamed Hostile Tom for some reason. And Tom got the deal with, uh, with EMI, which was a huge, huge leap forward for us. Tom was able to take their ideas and their opinions and their issues and their concerns and bring them into the record company with a very convincing story as to why we should take all of those concerns and ideas on board. I remember him saying to me one day, I manage this band and you should listen to them, their record's really good. And I went, oh yeah, and I never paid any attention to it. Originally they were signed to CBS, which is now called Sony, and, um, and they released um, West End Girls and it wasn't a hit. And CBS, in their infinite wisdom, uh, decided to part company um, probably helped along by Pet Shop Boys. So it was two years after we made it with the West End Girls with Bobby O that I left Smash Hits and we signed to EMI. Um, we, were, we had this demo tape, you know, the West End Girls and It's a Sin and Rent. But people were starting to think in 1984 that synthesizer duos were, were you know, old fashioned. You know, OMD, what have you. Soft Cell had broken up by then, I think. Um, so it wasn't, um, it didn't seem like the future necessarily being a synthesizer gym. And that's why we remade West End Girls uh, with Stephen Haig. And then I was listening to the radio with my wife. I remember, and I said, God, I really like this record, who's this? And she said, it's that band that Tom, uh, it's that band that Tom manages. So I said, oh, they're pretty good. There's a gun in your hand and it's pointing to your head. You think you're mad, you're too unstable. Kicking in chairs and knocking down tables in a restaurant in a West End town. Call the police. There's a madman around, running down, underground to a dive bar in a West End town. In a West End town, a dead end world. The East End boys and West End girls. In a West End town, a dead end world. The East End boys and West End girls. Two 
too many shadows, whispering voices, faces on posters, too many choices, if, when, why, what, how much have you got, have you got it to get, if so, how often, which you choose, a hard or soft option. Neil's voice really comes alive when he's double tracked. It, it, he's got a real pop voice. Um, what I like about Neil's voice is that you can uh, actually hear the lyrics clearly. I deliberately forced myself to do it in an English accent. Um, so I wasn't pretending to be, you know, a New York rapper or something. The reason I, I would say that I like it is um, when I was just getting into it, it was somewhere else for me. I had a, I had a vision of what, of what London was. And it was, you know, it was a magical place. And that was the beauty of, of these voices and these accents to me. To rap in a kind of middle class English voice, I guess it sounds a bit weird. But it made me feel self conscious because it sounded like me. There was no disguise, it sounded like me talking. His own voice is classic. You like to listen to him talk just because it sounds nice, you know. Where I, for example, have a mid-Atlantic um, singing voice because I talk like this. <laughs> and it's not nice to listen to, you know. And I can't do my songs when I talk like this. His voice is very different. When you hear Neil's voice, it's not only a pretty voice, he's not only a good singer, but it's got a quality to it that is unmistakable. It couldn't be anyone else that you're listening to. What makes Neil's voice so great is that it's so human. It's not a kind of uh, soaring baritone or something that kind of almost drives you back from the speakers. It's, it's the voice of, of someone you might be chatting to in a bar or a club or on the street, you know, it's it's so genuine and so human that it, it draws you into the songs and it makes you makes you feel a kinship with him and it makes you want to listen to what he's got to say. The way I first became aware of the Pet Shop Boys is I was on the radio in Los Angeles at a station called K-Rock and my father actually sent me a white label of one of their earliest releases from England because I was on a mailing list in England and he lived in Torquay and he would listen to all the records and he had uh, a real good taste in music. And he said, you're gonna like this one, you've gotta listen to this. So he sent it over to me and I remember getting it in the afternoon and thinking, I'm gonna play this tomorrow morning on the radio at K-Rock. So I took it in with me and I queued it up and it was you know, on vinyl and I listened to it and I thought, this is great. And I, I put it on, it says, brand new band. It's, it's the Pet Shop Boys and I don't know how many guys are in this or whatever, but it, it's awesome. And I played it and about halfway through, the red line flashes, which means the program director's calling. He goes, what are you playing? He goes, it's this new band, Pet Shop Boys. He goes, it's great. He goes, can you leave it in the studio so Jed can play it right after you? He goes, I want it played on the station every three hours. And that's the way the Pet Shop Boys got on the radio in America. And then the video came out for West End Girls. But at the time, MTV was looking for anything to play. They were still the fledgling upstart network. And it suddenly opened up all of America because they were coming into the living rooms of kids in, you know, No Hope Boise. And they were going, wow, this is so cool. These guys are making music that my local radio station's not playing, but it sounds so good. And they got forced, the local radio stations in the small markets got forced by MTV to start playing the Pet Shop Boys. To be honest, they'll be remembered for West End Girls. That's what America knows. Right now, there's a, you know, there's somebody eating lunch and listening to the pop station and it's, and it's retro lunchbox flashback and they're playing West End Girls. And that's what it is. It, it is just, uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, they, I mean, that's a big dent that they made. I don't know anybody that doesn't know that song.
West End girls seem to be almost impossible to pigeonhole musically. It, it, you know, was it a rap record or was it a, a kind of 80s disco record? It, you know, it sounded incredibly um, English. It sounded like a, a kind of northern town song, but it also sounded like a London song and it also sounded like a New York song. When West End Girls started to take off, which was amazing, it was then that we really started to think about the presentation of ourselves because we were going to be on the television. Being on the television, you know, it's a sort of terrifying thing. Um, you might get used to it, I think you ever quite get used to it, but um, what we were going to look like, what we were going to do, we didn't have an act. Um, we weren't a live band. Even though, on the face of it, you had the guy you talked and the guy you didn't talk, what you also had was this very clear visual image of this duo, um, which was, I suppose, influenced a little by Gilbert and George. Um, but it was, it was a very clear image, and it didn't look like anybody else. I think the whole thing was really driven by Chris in that respect. If Chris had been a totally showbiz, well, hey, kind of person. The Pet Shop Boys might be, I might have gone along with that as well. Who knows? I might have had choreography lessons. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Chris had his own pretty strong ideas of what he looked like anyway, with the legendary baseball cap and glasses. Um, and <laughs> actually, do you know what we're both wearing today? What we've, we've been, been on wearing. a very long journey. <laughs> we've been on a long journey. It's taken us back to wearing hooded tops and you mm. wearing a base. Because actually, this is what we used to dress like in 1985, really. And I got this coat from Stephen Linnard, and, uh, which was in two videos. And that sort of became my thing. We worked out this thing that I was the severe figure, and Chris was the you know, sort of more street kind of... Reluctant. Reluctance was always very much built into the concept. <laughs> Actually, in those early videos, it's great. Uh, Chris didn't really want to be filmed, you see, so that was always <laughs> funny. Still. Nothing has changed. You've got two guys who are basically really both shy. They both have kind of a wall in front of them. But Neil realizes that as the front person, as the voice, as almost the face of the Pet Shop Boys, he's got to be a lot more outgoing. And so he tends to be uh, that person, that performer, that persona in the interviews and, of course, on stage and in the videos. Chris is very happy just to step back and put his glasses on and let Neil do all the talking. For me, they're like a perfect double act because they absolutely complement each other, at least in your imagination. You sort of see Neil as this sort of bookish, rather sort of intellectual, erudite figure and, and Chris as this sort of technological wizard who's actually quieter. When you actually meet them in real life, you realise they are actually much more similar than that and those are roles they're playing. <laughs> Chris's way of operating is a blame-free and shame-free existence is to sort of maintain the fiction that it's nothing really to do with him anyway and that you have to talk to Neil about it. Um, which is so not the case, but that is the fiction that Chris runs. At first, of course, like, like everyone else, I wasn't quite sure what uh, Chris did. But then after we worked together on the record, um, it, I, I understood what, exactly what Chris did. And so Tom Watkins wanted to throw Chris out of the Pet Shop Boys because he evidently didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom was convinced. <laughs> it's a classic. The manager said, you've got to throw him out of the group. But it's great, that stillness, because you forget, mm. that was a time, I remember Level 42 had a keyboard player and he'd sit behind the keyboard, like this, you know. Like Shack that. attack. And it's so all... horrible and embarrassing. And you think, yes, yeah, stillness. Stillness is great.
it's not as if Chris just plays the keyboards and Neil does the vocals. They, it's a tag team because Chris is more lively in the morning um, and when he wants things done, then it's really hard to keep up with him because he'll say, right, give me this type of, type of drum sound and then give me this type of bass sound and I want a keyboard sound that's a bit like this and do you remember that record that did that noise there? I want one of those. Um, and it's, he presents you with a shopping list really quickly and it's my job to keep up with him and give him options, give him what he wants and then give him options as well. And generally while this is going on, Neil's sitting in the corner listening away and pecking away at emails and doing things and then he'll pop up and go, oh, I'm not sure about that or I like that. And then Chris will go, right, should we have lunch? And then we come back from lunch and then he sits down and goes to sleep and Neil takes over. And just when you think Chris isn't paying attention, he'll pipe up and go, oh, I don't like that bass line. I always found working with Neil and Chris, they're, they're very unequivocal, you know? Particularly Chris. You say, how about this electric piano? And he'd go, no, hate it, sounds like Bruce Hornsby. Uh, and he'd say, how about this then? And he'd go, love it, fantastic, you know? So there's never any sort of middle ground. Chris is, you know, a trained musician or whatever. I did music A-level and had piano lessons and trombone lessons and all the rest of it. And I taught myself to play the guitar and then I taught myself to play the piano. And I taught myself chord changes by playing other people's songs on the piano. Um, and therefore we were both writing in a different way. I write in a completely chord change way. Um, Chris writes in a fluid musical way. Chris also writes electronically, putting together lines to make music. I always just write with block chords. And I'm a good lyricist. <laughs> <laughs> the first two albums, uh, Please Naturally, the songs were all written around the same time. Um, we we'd used to go in this little demo studio in Camden and at the weekends and just write songs. When the album Please was out and Western Girls be number one and, and the album was doing well all around the world, it was top ten in America, I wondered whether we'd ever do anything, achieve anything like it again. I didn't feel hugely confident. Um, and a friend of ours said, oh, I think your, work, your best work's still ahead of you. And I said, wow, and I thought, wow, I so don't think that really. Um, and, and then when, on the next album, when we made it, I was thinking, God, we've got all these songs. It's a sin, rents, shopping, um, it couldn't happen here. And, and thinking how good the album was gonna be, and it was. Uh, and then It's a Sin being number one, and that was when we entered a different thing. Before It's a Sin, the Pet Shop Boys were regarded as a one-hit wonder. I think even there were people at EMI thought we'd be a one-hit wonder. And West End Girls, to be fair, is a classic one-hit wonder record. It's a sort of record, you make a record, it comes out of nowhere and it goes nowhere. We've got a huge pool of songs. They write songs that might be B-sides, might be A-sides, might be album tracks, might, we don't know what to do with this at the moment, tracks. The big change for us was when Western Girls became a hit in Europe after Britain, and we entered at the beginning of 1986, right after Christmas, we, we started doing European promotion, and then American promotion, and then Japanese promotion. And suddenly we went from having the hit in Britain was fantastic, you know, and it was number one and all that stuff. But suddenly the global thing, that's when stress came in. That's when it became very stressful, where we were always on a plane. Um, and it was good that we didn't tour. I think if we'd been a touring group, we'd probably have broken up at that point because it would have been, it would have been too much pressure. But we weren't, so we'd come back from promotion, we'd just go in the studio and write more songs. Um, um, but that was, once our life had changed on that, to that global thing, we'd settled into a pattern, not settled, but we, we got used to a, a way of living which hasn't changed that much to this day. Dusty Springfield's voice you, we were always aware of in the 60s. And I can remember seeing her now on the London, what's it called, Sunday Night at the London Palladium, singing I'm in the middle of nowhere in front of the curtain and thinking what a great record it was.
we needed a woman to sing on it because it was a duet between a man and a woman. And uh, there was a, a girl in Tom's office who said, well, you both love Dusty Sprinkle, why don't you ask her? And we said, oh, that's such a great idea. She was struggling to get the to get the right sort of pitch for the song and to get, you know, or to, or to get the right feel for the way that she was delivering the song. And she said, you know, what do you want, Tania, what, what do you want this to sound like? And he said, sound like Dusty Springfield, please, you know. And she hadn't quite realised that that's actually why they'd asked her to sing the song, is because whatever she did was, was fine by them. They've done so many important things. It's just, it's not just pop music. The fact that they're able to you know, say, I like Dusty Springfield, I want her to sing on this, you know, those are important things that they did. I didn't know who Dusty Springfield was until, in, you know, until that. Dusty really took that song and then made it something special. And, you know, the vocal on it is just, is just as good as anything she's ever done. Um, and then I had an idea for an ad lib at the end, we don't have to fall apart, that bit. And, and for Dusty, making a record is a lot of work because she really thinks through it. Um, and she said, oh, I thought we'd, fin I thought we'd finished. And uh, anyway, we went out and sang it together on adjacent microphones. And she did that bit quite quickly. At that particular point, they could do absolutely no wrong. Everything that was released was number one. And it was that real golden period. We felt that we knew what pop music was at that time, and I think we probably did know what pop music was at that time. Um, and also we were different. Uh, we'd made our weaknesses into strengths. The fact that we weren't performers didn't smile on this business. We'd made it into strengths. It is interesting thinking about the fact that it was four years between their first single and when they finally did some real live gigs. Because they must be the only act that made a feature film before they actually did a tour. So I actually thought it was great. I think it probably got critically panned at the time. But it wrapped up a lot of Pet Shop Boys sort of agenda, if you like, a lot of uh, background material. Jack Bond, um, the director and writer of It Couldn't Happen Here, um, we chatted a lot um, before he wrote the screenplay. And, um, and I'd forgotten just how much of our lives he'd put into it. Come on, everybody. Eat up. Oh, Chrissy, darling. I want you to eat everything up. Yes, eat it all up, Chrissy, baby. Oh, Chrissy. Darling, I shall miss you so much. Still, never mind. We'll have a nice little cuddle tonight. The seaside thing, um, being chased by people. Even my dislike of oysters is in the film. So there's a lot of... Um, my childhood, and there's a lot of Pet Shop Boys history in that film. If thou would see God's laws with purest light, thine eyes on heaven fixed must be. Whose fertile course the stars in peace doth bind. Please and actually seem to be songs that all came from roughly the same period and are, and are of a very similar style. And then there was this huge shift in their style to the introspective album, which seemed to be conceived as an album of songs that were ideal for 12-inch mixes. What most groups would probably have done for their third album would have been an album about the trappings of fame. <laughs> I mean, that's the actual, you know, that's the sort of cliché path that a band goes on. They have the success and then they sing about, it's not great. You know, um, 
and they point out the negatives, but we didn't do that. Within that album, you got, I suppose, the Pet Shop Boys' own Bohemian Rhapsody, which was left to my own devices, which is an epic of a song, um, a disco epic, if ever if there was one. <laughs> We worked on it, we did it all in Sinclair, which was a very uh, sophisticated sampling machine. And after we'd worked on it for, because at the time I was, I co-produced it with a guy called Steve Lipson, who's now a very, very successful record producer. And uh, and I remember trying to, uh, saying to him that, that I thought it sounded a little bit uh, posh and that we should purposely try and pull it back and make it a bit grungier uh, to offset the orchestra. The orchestra was, I thought the orchestra on Left to My Own Devices was absolutely brilliant. You take the majority of dance hits, dance songs, and strip away the dance beat, there's not a lot left. But you can't say that about the Pet Shop Boys. Their songs, that when you strip away the dance beats, there's often some very, very beautiful melodies and very profound lyrics. I always took them seriously, these songwriters. Uh, people throw, you know, oh, it's pop. And, you know, about any, any band, if they're saying that about the band, it's... Uh, it's not, it shouldn't be written off so easily. A, a great song is a great song. I can accept failure just as easily as I can accept success. Um, I wasn't quite so good when I was younger because I used to hate losing things like tennis and stuff. And, um, and actually domino dancing is because I kept losing at <laughs> dominoes and getting really angry and the mate was um, always winning and doing this, I was getting really... But um, as I've got older, I've got less competitive and, uh, and can accept situations better. People say, oh, uh, the video for Domino Dancing is very uh, homoerotic. Well, I, I guess, yeah, you can look at two guys fighting and think it's homoerotic. It wasn't the intention in the script. It's simply following the story of the song. The boy's in love with the girl, but she's going off with someone else. I mean, that's it. That's what, this, that's what the video is. Eric obviously had the idea that the two boys would romp in the sea. Because actually what they're doing is they're fighting each other. But that imagery is then translated through the modern filter of sort of Calvin Klein ads and things to be homoerotic. I don't believe the intention behind it was to be homoerotic. But no one I know will ever believe I will say that. Chris and I have a strange naivety. I think we both have a kind of naivety in that we do things and um, 
don't necessarily think them through that much. Um, if we trust what someone's doing, we let them do it. Um, but now, it, but people, if they know you're gay, they will see everything through a gay prism. And I don't think I or we look at things through a gay prism. I don't honestly believe we do. Do I think that being gay has affected them in America? Absolutely, 100%. America is still uh, getting used to, to, the, to, to the word gay. Um, so when you've got a band that's that's seen as you know this gay thing, it's it's instantly going to be there's going to be a little of a wall that's that's going to get put up. Britain and Europe they love their gay pop stars, but um, America does not. I just won this libel case against the Sunday People for this um, this guy said he'd slept with me and and this that and the other. Now the reason for me taking the Sunday People to court was because they lied, not because they accused me of being homosexual. But that day, my, my lawyer, not, not, it was nothing to do, I never said, you know, I never said do this. He stood on the steps and went, Robbie Williams is not and has never been a homosexual. Oh, for crying out loud. So anyway, that night we're at a restaurant and I went, I'm, I, I, they're going to hate me now. Everyone's going to hate me because they're going to think, you know, I'm homophobic. And Chris went, right, we're going to heaven. And I right. Yeah, all right, we'll go heaven. So we just bowled up at heaven, and it wasn't the busiest of nights, but um, I, had, I, had a, I had a really lovely night with them in there, sitting and watching the people watching us, watching them. And, you know, and everybody was really nice to me and gave me a love, <laughs> and were pleased to see me. Roy Clare, the, the guy that ran Clare Birds, was actually on the road with this, and I was trying to make conversation with him once, and I said, uh, so who, who are you out with last, Roy? And he said, we were out with a band called Queen. And I said, uh, did you like them? What did you think? He said, OK, if you like shrieking faggots. And I've always remembered that because I was like, that's America. Their popularity really began to decline significantly in terms of their mainstream success uh, with the song Domino Dancing, which was their last top 20 hit in the United States. Uh, and the domino dancing video in which two young men were posited as much, if not more, as sex objects as the beautiful young woman in the video. Um, uh, many people looked at that a little askance. After all, the world in the late 80s isn't what it is today. I think in many ways if the Pet Shop Boys had started out today, they would have had much better chance of sustaining success. But I think they were doing something very, very daring back then. I think that, uh, that it's perhaps not quite as much an issue in the general public and among young people uh, that it as it was 20 years ago. I think if they started now, it'd be like David Walliams and Matt Lucas. You know, they'd get that kind of press attention. The way they present themselves is so interesting because they withhold so much. And so it's like they've got a secret in a way and you're not really let in on it. And that is very beguiling, I think. I know what the secret is, though. <laughs> the one place that you can get away with it in America is the dance music world. Um, that probably is the one genre of music that, that allows for some of that. And that's probably why that that's where they find their biggest success in this country. They are the fourth most successful act, recording act, in the history of the U.S. dance charts. The only artists who've had more hits on the dance charts than the Pet Shop Boys are Madonna, Janet Jackson, and Donna Summer. The way that music business works is that there are always ways of doing things which are recognised. There are sort of uh, that you do this, then you do that, then you do that. And Chris and I, from a starting basic starting point, didn't want to do that. Didn't want to operate like that. So we didn't tour, the, you know, um, with our first album or second album, whatever. We waited till 
uh, we sort of had the nerve to do what we wanted to do, which is this big theatrical thing with Derek Jarman. You, you're my love, you're my hope, you're my dreams, my life, my passion, my love, my sex, my money, my violence, religion, and justice, and death. He'd worked in the theatre before, though, hadn't he? Um, doing something or other. Opera he'd done, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Derek, is, Derek Jarman just had a lot of enthusiasm and uh, a lot of great ideas and made things happen that, that might have seemed impossible, like the staging of It's a Sin. There's all these amazing costumes made for it. There were films made for back projection, and I can't really imagine anyone else who had the stamina, the energy and the creativity to, to put all that together. Um, he's a great person to work with. They are performing in the traditional way. There's no sweat there, so you're watching something, uh, you know, in a way much more stylish than that. And uh, and I'm certain that's, the, you know, the, the appeal. I, the, you know, the fact is that when it was all done at Wembley, you, you were watching almost, a, 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 you know, a great musical. The original theatrical idea came from the fact that we had no live performing experience whatsoever and we thought it would simply be too boring for us to sound and play our songs and that therefore we should try and make some amazing spectacle around us and that was always our modus operandi, it was to have an amazing thing happening around us. It's really quite opposite to how we are as people, it's a completely different side to us, I mean we're quite minimal, sober understated in real life. <laughs> Chris and I wrote so many songs when we first got to know each other that there are even now songs we haven't got around recording yet. Um, uh, nothing has been proved. I wrote a song and the lyric is that lyric. It's completely unchanged. And so I just dug it out and we wrote new music to it. We were asked to write a song for the film Scandal, and we suggested that maybe Dusty did it, because she's a sort of a voice from the 60s that was around then, and she was always fascinating to work with. I mean, you really learnt about singing, watching her with a cigarette and a cup of coffee, working her way through the... I mean, I remember thinking, 
told this story so many times, but uh, Nothing Has Improved has got a lot of lyrics. It's the whole story of the Profumo Affair. And she had to have the whole track with the orchestra and cranked up in the headphones. Then she would sing the first syllable and then say stop. And you'd look at the... And also I wanted to double track all the vocals. And it took... Anyway, it actually it only took two days, but... Um, but it's, it, it was quite hard work, but it, the result was great. We've always loved stars, real big stars, because um, we admire them actually. And we, and working within music, we know how tough it is to be a big star. I desperately wanted to work with Tennant and Lowe because I admire them so much, and they write such good songs for women. You know, if you take any of their songs, like Rent or Tonight Is Forever, it's about all the kind of things that we all know about. The Liza May look in Cabaret had a huge impact on uh, punk, if you think of Susie Sue. So it's, it, it was part of, of pop culture. It wasn't just like musical theatre or musical film. And so, to that extent, Liza Melly was a very powerful figure in our imaginations. And so Chris and I met her in the Mayfair Hotel. And it was funny because she opened the door and we all just laughed. She laughed and we laughed, but it was really, <laughs> it was really funny because <laughs> Chris and I were feeling giggly because we were, I guess we were sort of shy about this. Well, I mean, Liza, um, she, um, well. I had heard a song called Rent. Yeah. And I had asked every, I said, who is that? And who wrote that? And who's singing that? And they said, these two guys, right? <laughs> so I said, well, what are they called? And they told me the Pet Shop Boys. Then there's like an intermission of a couple of months. Now I hear, that maybe the Pet Shop Boys will do my album, produce it and write it, and I just went crazy. Losing My Mind came from the musical Follies, which at the time had been revived at the Shaftesbury Theatre in the West End. Um, and I thought it was a great song, and we just, of course, had the idea of, um, of putting the kind of thundering floor on the floor beat behind it. The sun comes up, I think about you. The coffee cup, I think Liza does not have a pop voice, and she's not used to singing with machines. She's used to singing with a band that responds to her, because machines, you have to respond to them, I'm afraid. This is the first session, and after about an hour, I said, when did the musicians get here? And they said, don't be mad. I said, what are you talking about? There aren't no musicians. There's just all these machines and us. But she, she got into it, and we had a lot of fun doing it with her. You said you loved me. I was very homesick for my girlfriend at the time, and we were playing Losing My Mind over and over, and eventually I just, I left, I came home. And that song, it really affected me. Uh, it, you know, that was my, my, my homesick song. I mean, it's actually in that Liza Minnelli album, um, results, you know, when you hear her sing Tonight's Forever and, and Rent, it's just absolutely breathtaking. The next project was Behaviour. Um, and behaviour, I think, is, is well known as not being critically well received and, and actually it didn't sell as well as the previous albums had done. Yet now we all know that behaviour is a great album. Um, and I think there's probably a few reasons for, for those things happening. I think the Pet Shop Boys started to leave people behind in the sense that they were being very, very groundbreaking. They were taking real creative risks and sometimes creative risks don't 
necessarily, even though they work creatively, they don't necessarily chime commercially. The first time I bought a Pet Shop Boys record was when I bought Behaviour in Woolworths for 6 99 It had been marked down. And um, I just sort of remembered that I quite liked some things that I'd heard of theirs before, so I took it home and thought it was awful. And then a couple of years later, I came back to it and realised it was genius. It's best to go with your own instincts and uh, do what you want to do. Um, also, our albums do tend to get re-evaluated after the event, so they might not get a good review at the time, but then the opinion or the... Yeah, the opinion changes over years of, of what's good and what isn't. Behaviour. I used to listen to that album all the time. I tried playing it to Americans, but they never really got it. it I thought it was too English for them, you know? But it used, always used to make me, uh, make me feel, you know, make me miss England. When I was at school, I didn't listen to bands and I didn't listen to much English music. We were all into hip hop and that's uh, all that we bought really, bought and stole, were hip hop records. And it wasn't until um, my taste buds got a bit more mature that I started to listen to things like the Beatles and, and um, the Pet Shops and New Order. So all these things were quite new to me when I joined Take That, you know, as a 16-year-old. So then I got into behaviour, and um, that became my friend. And I don't, you know, I don't want to... Um, as silly as that may sound, or as trite as that may sound, you know. While well, I was in Take That, there wasn't... Uh, I'd, I, there was times when I wasn't very happy, you know, and um, I used to bike to Manchester from Stoke-on-Trent, and all the way up there, I'd have behaviour on, all the way up there and all the way back, you know, and it was 50 miles up and 50 miles back. And um, just that album took me, took me to a place where, I don't know, it was... I, I, felt, I felt protected in some way by these songs, you know, I'd found this secret world. I try to bring things in to the lyrics from outside the normal pop cliches. And that's another thing that therefore ends up sounding English, because I try to use words or phrases that wouldn't necessarily be used. And also I tend to use, to put English cliches into, maybe even as the hook of a song, I wouldn't normally do this kind of thing, what have I done to deserve this? Uh, conversational phrases and make them the hook of a dance record. So it's a sort of a dialectic, it's, it's bringing together two opposites. Behaviour was the album that really made a lot of critics who had previously dismissed the Pet Shop Boys as a, merely a dance act. Uh, uh, looked at them and say, oh, these guys really do have some substantial songwriting skills. There are some really poignant, powerful songs here. song for me that stood out probably that meant something to me was being boring and I just assumed that it meant a lot to everybody I, and uh, it's just a special song. I hate using the word epic but it is when you think that it spans so many years of a, of a lifetime um, and it's so much about 
kind of regret and, and death and, and you know, some, some pretty heavy things that haunt everyone. For me, that, that was a whole new kind of benchmark in pop music. Some of the best music has that juxtaposition of uh, appearing joyful and fun on the outside and, and ending, ending up being very sour on the inside um, and, and a sense of deep melancholy. Um, and I think that, that, that that's one of the things that they do best. When you're young, you find inspiration in anyone who's ever gone and opened up a closing door. She said we were never feeling bored because we were never being boring. The narrator is beginning this personal reminiscence that's inspired by looking through some old photos and old memorabilia. And as memorabilia is designed to do, he starts thinking back. Being boring was, again, about the... When, when this friend of mine died, I wrote two songs. I wrote a song called Your Funny Uncle, which is about his funeral, which just describes the funeral. And at the end, his uncle, who was military, uh, who was been in the military, is very uh, upright, sort of officer material type, um, came up and shook everyone's hand and uh, it was very sort of proper. And it was sort of an extraordinary day for us all. It was all my friends that I met at the People's Theatre and, uh, you know, he was the kind of ringleader and he, and he, he died at the age of 32 or something. And uh, it made a big impact, you know, that's all. It made a big impact. And I wrote a song about it. And at the end, your funny uncle staring at all Today. And actually that song is very much written in the style of me in the mid-70s, actually. Um, it's because some of my friends said, oh, it's the old Neil Tennant that they used to know. Um, and then being boring. Someone said, if you're not careful, you'll have nothing left and nothing to care for in my 1970s. And I just went back. Uh, it's about finding the photograph of the party invitation, everyone dressed in white. And, uh, and then it goes forward to me leaving London. Um, and then uh, what had happened, and he'd, I become famous and he died. Yeah, there was a Beatles song that it it, uh, it, it, all, it reminded me of In My Life, being boring, and reminded me of In My Life. It, I thought it was kind of a modern version of that. One of the great things about Pet Shop Boys' lyrics um, is that they do deal with very personal and emotional issues, and I think that's why they connect so well with people. Now I sit different faces in rented rooms Places. All the people I was kissing, some are here and some are missing in my 1990s. There's that, that element of both fear and regret and perhaps even a little guilt that I've survived, I'm still alive. There's a certain joy there, but at the same time there's this great sadness that, but all these other people that I loved, that were important to me, they're not here anymore. It's a sad song. <laughs> uh, he manages to, they manage uh, to, cap, to capture the sadness, but there's also 
he, he fits himself into it. He fits all of these people. That's, that's the, the beautiful thing about that song. It covers so much. Uh, and it's still selfish. It's still about him. And, uh, you know, my favorite line I've talked about in interviews before is, uh, I never dreamt that I would get to be the creature that I always meant to be. And uh, I think that's, that's just my favorite. I never dreamt that I would get to be the creature that I always meant to be. But I thought, in spite of dreams, you'd be sitting somewhere here with me. Bruce Weber, uh, he's a fashion photographer. And we wanted something very beautiful and glamorous, uh, but not in a corny pop star kind of way. And so again, he was, he'd never done a pop video before. They called me and they said, do you want to do a, a video? And I, I thought, well, I don't know if I really want to do one. I said, you know, what kind of rules do we have, you know? You know, when you do a music video for a record company or for a recording artist, you have a lot of rules. And I don't think they knew what to answer, so they said none. We've always given a lot of control to people if they know what they're doing. In fact, we prefer to work like that. Um, if someone, if a video director's got a good idea and he's going to make it, why get in the way? Um, we had an idea for the Being Boring video. I can't remember what it was now, but I know we had an idea for it. And uh, Bruce Weber said, no, I think we should get, hire this house in Long Island. I'll get these kids have a party. And we said, yeah, great. So I thought about all my friends. And I'm always with a lot of people, you know, and dogs and things like that. And so uh, I said, oh, OK. And we will never be boring. We dressed up in thoughts and thoughts make amends. Nan and I said to them, but we will send you the finished product. You have to trust us. And they were so trusting. It was so wonderful for that to happen in the music world. We just got a video sent over and he said, that's it. And it was quite clear to us we weren't allowed to change it anyway. Um, and it didn't need changing, so it was, it was a brilliant, absolutely brilliant video. For me, the video kind of put it in a context. It, it has that incredible kind of, um, I don't know, it's almost like a sort of Cecil Beaton feel to it or something. It's, it's just the sense of something beautiful that's gone. To look at that video now, you realise that it's an amazing film. It's an amazing piece of work. Maybe because I was never invited to a lot of parties, I, I wanted to have a party that maybe I wouldn't be invited to. It got criticised because essentially it was black and white, a terrible thing for MTV apparently, and secondly, um, it hardly featured the artists. You could just about see them popping up now and again amongst all these legions of very good-looking boys and girls. And yet, it, it is just an incredibly rich piece of film. So much of it is to do with the casting, but also the way he works, because he generates this awe and this love, you know, and, um, and everyone's taken, you know, it's really a beautiful experience. <laughs> Being Boring is still one of my favourite singles that we've ever released, and I think it's probably one of the worst performing singles. So there's no point in being put off releasing records that maybe aren't going to do so well. They did things in their career, especially early on in their career, which seemed utterly blasphemous uh, to uh, the rock mainstream. And I think there, there are many different examples of that, Opportunities, the song Opportunities being one of them. Uh, but perhaps the most outrageous and most brilliant example of that was what they did with uh, U2's uh, Where the Streets Have No Name, which is uh, a, a, an almost shocking deconstruction of rock mythos. It had always had a wonderful dance beat. Well, the Pet Shop Boys simply emphasized that 
and did with synthesizers what U2 had done with the guitars. But then, in the most shocking move of all, they turned it into a medley with an utter pop trifle, Frankie Valli's uh, I Can't Take My Eyes Off You, implicitly suggesting that there's not a spit's worth of difference between the two of them. I definitely don't view their their music as dance music. I think it's music that you can dance to, but I don't think of it as dance music. I do think of it as pop music, but but I think pop music and rock music are, are the same thing. I think that there's something very rock and roll about the Pet Shop Boys. People saying that, oh, pop is over here and rock is over here and never the twain shall meet, when it's actually a continuum, you know, that that pop and rock are you know nuances of the same genre of music and you'd even take a band like the Beatles where uh, or were they a rock band or were they a pop band well some of their songs were poppier than others some were rocker than rockier than others um, they were a little bit of a little all of that it's very cool to say I you know I don't like pop music I think a lot of it came with uh, people like the Spice Girls and over here we have in sync and the Backstreet Boys and things that were put together and were described as pop acts, all of a sudden that cheapens what Morrissey and the Pet Shop Boys are because they consider themselves to be a pop act. Pop, by its very nature, I think, takes from everything and, and changes all the time. You can do anything in pop. If, if, if you know, you, could, you can throw in rock, ambient music, Anything. One of the things about the Pet Shop Boys is we've always tried to bring in subject matter from outside pop music, stuff that wouldn't normally be there, just like the Beatles did when they wrote Eleanor Rigby or Yellow Submarine, that um, Strawberry Fields Forever. That stuff had never been in pop music before. And, and really, there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been in pop music. You know, and I put right songs about history. Um, you know, my October Symphony, which is a, uh, about a composer looking back at all the official work he's done in the Soviet Union and then wondering what it means that the Soviet Union doesn't exist. One of the great things about the Pitch Boys' success was that it meant that you could do anything you wanted to do in a way. Um, so you could employ the design director from the English National Opera and do a tour with 14 dancers. Ironically, it was their dance sound that started to hurt them here in the States because radio in America towards the end of the 1980s fanned Nirvana. It happened to a lot of people. Uh, when Nirvana came and grunge came, uh, a lot of music became kind of obsolete. Nirvana actually changed everything, just like the Beatles changed everything when they came along. And for radio, they changed it in a good and bad way. They kind of shook music out of the doldrums it was in. But also, they closed radio to a lot of dance tracks. And in America, radio is segregated. 
you've got black radio, you've got white radio, you've got talk radio, you've got pop radio. Suddenly, if you're a white radio station, you couldn't play dance songs. You could only play rock songs. As opposed to the 80s, radio all of a sudden decided that they weren't going to have much colour. You know, it's all going to be, you know, it's either going to be blue or red or green, and that's it. And anything that's skirting around the edges, we're going to clear that off. I remember a general manager coming into K-Rock at the beginning of the 1990s and putting on Blue Monday from New Order and saying, do you hear that song? We're never going to play it again. It seemed like the American uh, marketplace had moved on. They were probably looking for different things. Or maybe the, the reality of what Pet Shop Boys were, i.e. something a lot more sophisticated and a lot more multi-level and not quite as as uh, one-dimensional as maybe was being perceived, um, confused the marketplace. Because one thing about the American marketplace that you shouldn't do is confuse it. You need to be very, very clear about what you are. And Pet Shop Boys um, are a lot of different things. So no matter how great their singles were, Can You Forgive Her would come out, but it wouldn't get played because it didn't fit in with that grunge scene. It was love. There's no space for alternative music in the States anymore. They call it, they'll like shove a band in your face and call it alternative, but, but there's no, you know, there's not any real, the only place, I mean, now think, I mean, the internet is really changing that. I mean, you can really find out about bands on the web. There was um, a low point, I can't remember what it was now. Um, I once said to Chris, oh, should we just jack it all in? And Chris didn't answer me. And then we started to talk about something else, so... Um, oh, really? Yeah. Not like me to avoid the issue, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I never raised it again. That was that we just carried on. I mean, I probably just carried on regardless because I probably think, well, well you know, what else am I going to do? <laughs> you know, I don't want to become an architect, not after all this time. And um, I'm, I think I'm basically unemployable. When we first start, first heard the songs that were going to be on on Very, undoubtedly, you know the, the the smiles lit up the room because it was so obviously commercial, yet still very high quality. We often react against our previous release, um, and so Very was just exactly what we felt we wanted to do at that time uplifting, um, slick pop. And that was definitely a reaction to the previous album, Behaviour. Very I remember being about 18 when Very was the one that, for me, and it still is, I think, to this day. The funny story is I had the opportunity to meet Neil and Chris, and uh, he asked me what he, you know, he said, well, what do you, what do you like of ours? And I said, uh, 
I said, very. And he said, uh, oh, you're one of those. And I didn't know how to take that, if that was a good or a bad thing. Well, the packaging for Very was, uh, was, was unique. It was a first. It was totally original. And it was a massive pain in the ass to actually get together. Um, but it was well worth it because you had this thing that didn't just look great. It felt great. It was tactile. It was, it, it was reminiscent of Lego or something like that. And they were absolutely insistent that whatever it costs, this is, you know, this is what they wanted to do. Now, up until then, you got your CD. It might have a different booklet for whatever album you were buying, but the actual case was always the same. Well, of course, they wanted to change the bloody case now, didn't they? So now you had this uh, totally original plastic jewel case. And it was fantastic um, because it, 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 it fitted into the record racks, as a good CD should do, but it was totally different from anything else in the racks. We'd worked with um, David Alden and David Fielding on the performance tour. And um, we thought it would be good to carry that on. And carry on working with David Fielding, and um, and he came up with these cartoonish costumes, really, with the pointy hats and the orange jumpsuits and all this kind of thing. Very also had um, one of the best cover versions of all time, which is Go West. And, um, and I think that that is as good, for me, is probably one of the top five Pet Shop Boys records, even though they didn't write it themselves. You sort of feel they could have done. Go West, uh, it was Chris's idea to do a cover of The Village People, and Neil was like, no way, we're not doing a cover of The Village People, it's way too naff, it's way too camp. Um, and yet the moment when Chris said, no, no, it's got to go like this, and then he just started playing the melody and said, give me a French horn, so French horn sound. He said, here we go, it's like this, and immediately Neil could hear it. To go west with, for us was more to do with AIDS. Chris said, oh, it's, it's great, and it's very classical, the chords you like it. Now, because I thought the Village People record was horrible. And, um, and then you, you became aware, singing it, that it's that Go West thing. It was the sort of, when I first ever went to gay, or was a, I didn't really go to gay clubs then, but uh, when I, was, I had a friend who was a clone, who wore a check shirt and a moustache, and I didn't like that whole thing. At that point in my life, I thought, I don't really want to be gay. I don't like the whole, this whole regimented thing they all have. And, uh, and I felt I had a, a girl, I was involved with a girl at that point. And, but Go West was this dream of going to San Francisco and living the gay life, and it was gonna be fabulous. And uh, the sort of tales of the city, Olmsted, Mopam kind of thing. And, and then of course, no one knew about AIDS. There where the air is free will be what we want. So that dream was at the very least changed, if not destroyed by AIDS. And in the 80s and early 90s, we knew we had friends who died of AIDS. And it was, you, one always knew someone in a hospital bed. There are many ways in the sun or shade. We will find the place where there's so much space. So when we did Go West, it's super camp and all the rest of it. Um, but it's also, it's, a, it's an elegy. It's an elegy for time that's gone.
some pop music seems to last much better than other pop, other pop music. And I think um, the fact that the Pet Shop Boys always used the, the dance genre and they were sort of putting songs with meaning over, over dance beats, some people don't like that, you know? Some people think that the two things don't go together. They just have a lot of connection to who they are. And that thing that who they are is always changing. And that's what sort of makes them really interesting, you know? They're, they're not a, a bunch of musicians that you know, like, oh, wait, I've heard that before. One area where the Pet Shop Boys do get their dues and do get the respect that they deserve is in the music press, partly because of the, you know, the Pet Shop Boys' background. Um, in being a sort of very intelligent group and you know somebody that's actually something to write about and obviously journalists love to have something proper to write about not to have to kind of deal with idiots all the time. The songs do have this guise and and to the ear might sound throwaway or disposable or insipid but but really you peel back a couple of the layers and they're incredibly smart incredibly funny incredibly dark and and loving beautiful songs. I don't really mind with the people pay that much attention to the lyrics. I know, for me, uh, I listen to the overall sound of a record. I don't necessarily listen that carefully to lyrics. Sometimes I'll think, oh, that's a great line. I don't focus on the lyrics separate from the music. I take it the whole thing as a package. Actually, Dusty Springfield said to me she never listened to the lyrics in songs. I was quite surprised because she's such a good interpreter of them. And she just said she listened. She was a, she was a sound person as well. I was down in Florida, and uh, we sort of ended up over at uh, Wet n Wild. I had been f uh, photographing some um, wakeboarders there, and I saw this place, and I went there. And I thought, oh, I want to photograph here. I want to film something here. But who is crazy enough to let me come here, you know? And then they called. I really feel that that film is really uh, kind of about acceptance and about expression. You know, we all look at these people and think, oh, that person's so beautiful, but do they have a soul? And I think that has a lot to do with that video, and that's why my favorite person in that video is this little kid that we met. We didn't even cast him, we met him there. And um, he's quite heavy set, and he just had this beautiful face and this total sweetness, and he was so into the girls, you know? And um, me and Neil and Chris, we just really liked him a lot. You know, we just liked his feeling. And so that's why we ended up with a lot of different kinds of shapes of people. Oh, my dogs, they went crazy you now. <laughs> Troy. Hey, Troy, come back here. Come on, Billy, come on, come on, come on, guys. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's a real pet shop boys moment. <laughs> We'd just done a tour of uh, South America <laughs> and, um, and we were very inspired by a lot of the music we heard there and a lot of the um, audiences and, and just this, they were so up for it and um, had such a good time. Here we are. We just did a Latin album, um, which was successful in South America. <laughs> it was a few years later that, oh, Latin music really exploded in the mainstream. Uh, the Pet Shop Boys were a bit ahead of the curve in that.
After that, they their next album was Nightlife. People who didn't particularly appreciate the uh, Latin ex, uh, experiments, if you will, of bilingual, saw Nightlife as kind of a return to the more mainstream dance music, uh, very dance-oriented album. I used to go-go dance in New York and dance on bars, and around that time that that was happening, uh, New York City Boy was playing always. And whenever I hear that song, um, it's a, now it's a very kind of nostalgic song for me because I, I think of myself. And, and I remember dancing on the bar thinking, you know, that's me they're singing about. The first song I danced to on a, on a dance floor in a disco uh, was New York City Boy. This was at a, very, you know, a hip club here in Las Vegas, and uh, it's still, they were able to, to, to be right there with whoever it was, that, you know, the Chemical Brothers or whoever else was getting played next to them. They were able to, they were able to, to grow with the times. So young, so raw, you're a New York City boy. So young. <laughs> I can't remember how I found out that they were writing a musical. I felt that it was kind of veering slightly into self-parody, actually, when I heard they were, that they were doing it. And I thought there would have to be something quite spectacular to pull it off without it just being a, a cliché. So it's actually a sort of rock and roll cliché, isn't it, the musical we always promised ourselves. But we actually did want to do one. But, our, but what we were trying to do with Close to Heaven was to have um, contemporary subject matter and use um, pop music rather than the sort of music that you get in musicals. It wouldn't be surprising that they would set, they and Jonathan Harvey, their collaborator, would set the musical in a, in a nightclub, um, in a venue where dance music is to be expected. A lot of the characters in Close to Heaven are quite close to some real people, um, and the situation with, you know, within the club. And originally there was a lot more stuff going on backstage. Um, in, in the back rooms of the club, you know, with all the sort of surveillance cameras that there are now in all the clubs in London, and a lot of it was based on all of that. So, yeah, it was based on experience. I knew their music, I loved their music. I loved bopping to it at parties and at clubs, and, and I'd heard them interviewed, and I knew that they'd been to college, they were at the, you know, the highbrow end of the pop market, if you like, and they were very articulate. And um, although Chris appears not to speak, he never stops. <laughs> that I thought was very amusing. Uh, he just doesn't speak in, in public. It's a just fantastic opening number, uh, My Night. Uh, very exciting. Uh, it, it's like, it's almost like a textbook study in a great opening number. It's very reminiscent in many ways of the song uh, Comedy Tonight from Stephen Sondheim's A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, a song that starts up the musical and is designed to get the audience in the mood for what's to follow. I'd never heard music like this in the theater, and I just thought that was so exciting and so important to have another option that it is something I mean you know the idea that I've been involved in a musical still amuses me to this day but it isn't a musical it's it's a it's a, a pop opera there was a lot of um, humor in it I mean Jonathan Harvey's writing was very funny 
and, um, and a lot of I think there's a lot of emotion in it as well. And I think that a musical can only succeed if there's an emotional content. That's the whole point of it, really, isn't it? I mean, to reduce people to tears um, and to have a good time as well, obviously. You know, to, but you've got to be on that sort of arc. You've got to go on this journey. If you see um, the Rod Stewart musical, or if you see. Um the, 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 the We Will Rock You or Mamma Mia. It's basically getting the songs of those bands that are so beloved and putting them into some kind of daft little story in terms of the book, because all the audience has come to, to do is see and celebrate the songs that, that are there that they know so well and can sing along. Well, these songs were brand new, but each song had its own narrative in, term, in the lyrics. So if you like, it was, it's the same as a recitative in The Marriage of Figaro. It pushed the narrative forward. It was critically acclaimed in a couple of places and slaughtered in most of the places, I think. It was sad that the critics didn't like it, but the audiences were, went demented about it. I mean, they were crazy every night. We actually used some of the bad reviews, or one of the bad reviews, A Disgrace, the Daily Mail. We used to have it on a poster outside the theatre. It's funny though, because the, the cast recording album is probably one of the best collections of Pet Shop Boy songs that there is. One of the critics that um, Savage, Close to Heaven, has since apologised and said that he got it completely wrong. Um, I think with anything creative, there's a lot of politics involved in, in it, and I think that the, um, the theatre world likes to protect itself, and like all industries, I don't think it likes people from the outside coming in and having a go. The only wounding one was the Independent, who said it was a vanity project. And I thought that was a really nasty and bitchy thing to say, because you, you don't put that much work into something as a vanity project. You do it because it's something you really want to do. I know for a fact that they were incredibly offended by the sexuality of the dancers, who at times, if they'd seen what was going on backstage, they had nothing to be offended about on stage, I tell you. But the dancers wearing very, very, very little and nothing to the imagination was left, um, went down into the audience and wiggled their gorgeous, well-worked-out torsos and asses in front of some of their faces. And, of course, they just hated that. <laughs> things that were wrong with the musical weren't necessarily the things that the Pet Shop Boys were responsible for, but considering it was sort of billed as the Pet Shop Boys musical, you would have thought that they, they should have banged it into shape, really. We compromised, and I think Close 7 was done in a more traditional way than it should have been done, than, than, our, than we originally planned. Um, originally, we wanted to Close to Heaven as a sort of promenade performance within a club, and actually, it's just theatrically, it's too difficult. It is too difficult to do. the notorious meeting where they went through the script and took um, particular four-letter words out, all the way through the script. I mean, Jonathan Harvey would be annoyed now about it. Um. <laughs> the part of Billy Tricks, which Frances Barber played, became a lot bigger um, when we realised that she was such a great character. It almost became the Billy Tricks show, in a way. We decided that she probably definitely lived in New York. Um, whether she wasn't born there, but she was certainly, that was a large part of her life. And she probably hailed from Germany because that was kind of the hip place. And so it was a kind of German accent with a little bit of, um, you know, New York and at the same time. And so it was just, <laughs> who knows? She was also drunk all the time. She was also on drugs the entire time. So, you know, her accent veered wherever she went. Can you see the
friendly fire that's just one of, for me, lyrically, one of the best songs that's been written in the last 10 years. You know, the song's just simply on a guitar or a piano, because I think that's when, you know, songs become undeniably great. performed a few of the songs at Heaven nightclub one night and 2,000 gay men with their tops off screamed my name and that was it. I just, I, I thought if I'd ever had a reservation in my life about doing this, I would, you know, what am I saying? I was Madonna for a night and I, they carried me through to the VIP room. There I was, a gay icon. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? We both think that there's a way of using music, pop music in the theatre that maybe hasn't even been done yet. But I don't know what it is, <laughs> but I think there is. Hailed in, in in some quarters as their rock album. I think they realize that there are intelligent people out there who really didn't believe that the Pet Shop Boys were real musicians. 
Uh, and I think they decided with the album release to sh say, yes, we are real musicians, whatever that means. We do play instruments. Uh, we can do rock ballads. In some ways, it was their stab at cred. It's almost as if they kind of just going to get a hero's welcome for it because they went so completely off message with with release, which they had every right to do because it was, you know, they were got several albums into their career and of course you'd want to do something completely different. Pet Shop Boys, um, right in the middle of this revival of electronic dance music, decided to do a much more acoustic album with release. And why the hell shouldn't they? Because they are Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> It depends what you want from the Pet Shop Boys. There's people who just think we're kind of, hey, camp pop, you know. Um, and um, there's the people who think we're kind of Stephen Sondheim-y. Um, a lot of people like us, well, a lot of people say to me, oh, but what I really like from you is, the, is all the ballads. That's what I really like. <laughs> It wasn't too surprising that they would do a West End musical. I think I've got to say, hand on heart, that I was very surprised that they decided to stage Battleship Potemkin in Trafalgar Square with a full orchestra. I think that was something that you probably couldn't predict. Yes, prepared, yes. Um, how do we know when we're starting? Oh, hello. Oh, it's so, oh, oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Great. Oh, I love it. I'm loving it. I think. I'm always performing in front of gauze. Man. I love the gauze. It's just, it feels strangely inside. unlike anything we've ever done before. Um, it's whether one had the musical and technical ability to do that. It wasn't necessarily a given that we'd be able to do it. We normally write in classical pop structures, so verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle bit, outro, whatever. And we were f totally freed from that for doing Potemkin. It was just music. I mean, apart from the couple of songs that are in there, most of it's just music and that was quite um, a liberating experience. We've always had delusions of grandeur as well, you know. 
um, always had delusions of grandeur. I mean, the first, when we did the tour, right from the beginning, we were both agreed that the show was going to be unlike any other show, and it was going to be incredibly theatrical, and, um, and we didn't really think through it that well, but we, we always wanted it to be something sort of amazing. Um, and with Battleship of Temkin, we thought, wow, we just think it's going to be a silent film at Trafalgar Square, a free concert, you know, it's sort of amazing. Rather than getting a very sweet Hollywood lush score, they thought they'd get something a bit more edgy. And Torsten definitely did that. And sometimes he came up with just amazing things, you know, these kind of you know, people slapping things and twanging the, the double basses and what have you. Working with Torsten Rash and these amazing sort of discordant arrangements. Um, I found very exhilarating. Recent years, we've really experimented with extending the tonality of the music. On the Battleship Potemkin project, there's a track on that which I think is one of the best things we've ever done, which is called After All, which is the Dessa Step sequence. It's a sort of an anti-war song. And it's daringly dissonant. Pop music isn't really dissonant. So we went to Berlin to record the orchestra there, the Dresden Symphonica, and they're really, they're the, they're the kind of the cream of the interesting players in orchestras. They're the they get paid peanuts for it because there was just not, not much money for it, but they're so enthusiastic about playing new music that it just made it fantastic. I was, you know, stood in, in, in the crowd on that, you know, rainy evening um, and watching this um, incredibly serious Russian arts film and listening to Pet Shop Boys music and I thought, well, only the Pet Shop Boys could actually, you know, bring all of these people together to watch Battleship Potemkin in its original Russian in this way. <laughs> it was unusual. To do something where the music is a special element, and in, for Bachelor Potemkin, it's half the project. You know, you've got the film, you've got the music, and that's it, really. Um, you know, that's a, and it's a big event. I enjoyed the process of having the film there and, and, and writing specifically to film. We never had to do that before. What was amazing, because watching it from stage, was that when the when the film started, all these people standing with their umbrellas just put them down so people could see. And so for the first 10 or 15 minutes, it was chucking it down, and people were just standing there being so... I've never seen it before. People taking umbrellas down so the people behind could see the, the film. Everybody did fantastically, and it was it was great in the end, but very nerve wracking because it's not something we've ever done ever done before.
Town Square, thank you very much. Dresses in Fonica. They've continued to move forward, they've continued to try new things. I mean, I can't think of any other band of their era that is still doing that today. And it's really inspiring. It's, it's one of those things that really, you know, for me as a songwriter, it, it makes me kind of slightly seethe with jealousy almost, because, you know, you want them to kind of stop, you know, like give us a chance to catch up or something. But, you know, that's, that's what makes a, a really great band, I think. <laughs> well, there's this Swedish duo called West End Girls. I'm Isabel. I'm Rosanna. And, and we are the West End Girls, Thanks. actually. And they're very young, they're in their teens, and they just perform Pet Shop Boys covers. Isabel has always sings and I always play the keyboard so since we were eight I think. Yeah. We have never fight about who been Chris and who is Neil because yeah. it I really like to sing and Neil sings so she's always been interested in keyboards and computers and stuff like that so The boys are the best band in the world and we really love them. Yeah, they got really great songs and fantastic image. It's really great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <clears> On <throat> oh, no, our last album released is a song called The Samurai in Autumn, which came from a review of us because they were wearing these wigs and things. And uh, the headline in Germany was The Samurai in Autumn. And the lyric is, it's not as easy as it, as it was or as difficult as it could be for the samurai in autumn. And now that was me writing about me and Chris uh, in 1999 or 2000 or something. And that's true. It's not as easy as it was or as difficult as it could be. Must I, Neil Tennant, spend the rest of my days in this pet shop? No, because I have just met Chris Lowe, purveyor of electronic music. Hit it, Chris! Each album starts with the same thing, which is a CD or a cassette of a bunch of finished songs. And then what we want to do is, to, is try and realise them fully, uh, make them as make them better than they are, because they're, they're normally quite complicated demos. Well, working with Trevor Horn, for instance, we had, we had all of these songs completely demoed. How many tracks would... Uh, would uh, 24 or 48 tracks of, of stuff per, per song. And Trevor would keep everything and sort of sift through it and try and make it better. The new album, Fundamental, it started off and it was going to be very minimal and very electro. And it started off like that, but it just grew. Um, and Trevor Horn got involved, so it became less minimal. <laughs> the funny thing about this record, Fundamental, is that they'd done a lot of the work already when, they, when, they, when I started on it. You know, I mean, Neil had done most of his vocals already, which, which could, is quite often the thing that takes the longest on a record. But Neil had already done, he'd already done them, and, and I didn't really feel much of a need to redo them because, you know, they sounded great. So, so, I had, so, so we had the vocals. Um, it was just a question of, um, of really on this record how far, they, how far they wanted to go. They're musically very, very clever. And, and you know, for me, they, they tick all the boxes. Um, but. It is interesting that, that their songwriting skills haven't been as appreciated, perhaps, as, um, as, as, as other songwriting duos. But, but 
but to be honest with you, maybe, maybe they are being appreciated now. I don't think there's any reason why Tennant and Lowe shouldn't be regarded in the same sort of breath as Lennon and McCartney, really, in terms of a kind of British songwriting duo who've kind of pushed the boundaries and, you know, had, had a huge influence on people. I think it's, it's odd that people don't regard them up, as up there with those two. What is it, 20 years? Most people don't, don't, don't last five years, and let alone they've gotten better. It's always nice to still be around, really. I mean, you know, particularly at the moment in the music industry, um, a, a lot of record companies don't actually stick with artists very long, for, you know, through a period that they might regard as not very successful. And uh, um, I think one of the great things about Parlophone is that they do actually treat you as an artist, not just as someone who's selling sort of product. Chris and I share in the fantasy that was and is and will be the Pet Shop Boys. And there's also the sense in that it's a conspiracy of two people, Pet Shop Boys. Um, Chris and I are quite conspiratorial with each other. Um, you know, and there is, there is that sense. Um, also, it's unusual for two people to come together and have one creative personality, which is sort of what we've done anyway. We became friends first and then started the songwriting and um, yeah I know a lot of people find it weird that um, various members of a group can actually be friends as well as it, because it seems to be the norm now that um, groups come together professionally and don't get on socially whereas I, I find that situation odd <laughs> I think it would be odd not to um, get on with Neil and socialize with Neil I mean I hope to follow in their footsteps because all those things that they do are the things that I want to do. Ultimately, what we set out to do was to create our own world, was to create, was to be separate from other groups, to not be tainted by the whole thing. Um, and I think we've been reasonably successful in that objective. I think we've created a world where we do things the Pet Shop Boys way. Beautiful tunes, intelligent lyrics, and all my favourite chords. I think the new album, Fundamental, um, is incredibly Pet Shop Boys in terms of the musical styles and moods, in terms of the lyrics and what the songs are about. We aim to be pop-tastic, I suppose, whether we succeed or not. And sometimes we disappear um, along the way. But, um, but, yeah, we want to be yeah, great pop music. A friend of ours said to magazine, in fact, to say, she says, oh yes, she says, I know what you do, depth through surface. <laughs> and um, I guess that is what we do, and that's why it can be taken in, in quite a few different ways. And I personally think that's a big strength. The greatest pop act of the last 20 years. Almost as good as Eurasia. <laughs> no? I know that'll wind them up so we run. What do you reckon? I'm Chris Lau. I'm the other one. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> the West End town, the